hire service users. It makes sense. But but I mean, if you step back and you and you know and you look at that, you say, my God, <laughs> yeah, we're saying people have to get jobs, but we refuse to hire them. I mean, it's just it's perverse. And the neat thing about recovery movements outside of psychiatric disability is that a core of it really has to do with taking responsibility, understanding your experience, and taking responsibility for your life. And so if you're being helped, if you're a service user, and you're being helped by somebody who has gone through their own recovery process and really understands the process of recovery, then people are going to treat you, that person's going to treat you with clearer boundaries, because that person knows you need to get to a point of taking responsibility for your life. Whereas somebody who's not been through recovery may, not, may only know that intellectually, but uh, not necessarily as helpful. Um, there's a lot we know about the recovery process in general, and, it, and it, it, um, it mirrors the recovery process in terms of a lot of different conditions. Um, uh, and and uh, the, the literature on recovery across conditions really uh, suggests that we go through sort of a set of, of, of phases uh, or stages, you know, and you sort of go back and forth between them and so forth. It's not necessarily a linear, linear process. But initially, there's a process of just shock and denial. With a lot of young people who experience uh, mental illness just at the time when their age peers are going off to college or going off to really launch a career. You see an awful lot of this. And, and, and this makes perfect sense uh, during an initial, uh, following an initial psychotic episode or, or major psychiatric crisis because what the person's really dealing with here is having to accept the realization that their life might be fundamentally different than all of what they thought their life would be up when they were growing up in the same age cohort. And if you look at where mental illness, uh, the data on when mental illness tends to begin uh, to surface, um, it often is in late adolescence, early adulthood is one of the sort of the peaks of that. And I think sometimes we forget how incredibly traumatic that is for people. Because in fact, that's a parting of the ways from your peer group at a time when peer connections are terribly important to you. And so it is not at all surprising that people would be in denial about that. Often a first few admissions that people have, um, uh, folks continue to get readmitted because they won't take care of themselves in a way that acknowledges that they have a set of problems that they have to deal with. And this is why in a first admission situation or an access situation like we were talking about before, it's so critical immediately to have people hook up with other users who are actively understanding the process of recovery. You know, it's just like somebody who, uh, a woman is stuck in the house in an abu uh, abusive, battering relationship, and finally she gets the perspective and the courage and the, and the confidence, and she sort of touches the service system. You know, and in this case, it'd probably be a battered women's shelter. And it's so critical at that point when she first touches the system that she touch people who have been through it and can say this is it and this is what you're struggling with and who understand this stage. Okay? Is everybody with me? Uh, people go through a, a, a natural, normal process of really grieving how their life has changed. And we need to encourage people to do that. Because unless they get past that, this is where you get sort of this chronic lifestyle of loss of motivation. Unless a person really actively grieves and moves through that, they kind of get stuck in that place where they are in such despair over how their life has changed. And then suddenly, 30 years later, the person is still stuck in the same place. Um, and there, is a you know, there are realistic changes that people need to accept uh, in terms of what's happened. Anger, which is just terrifically healthy. Uh, <laughs> you know, if, if, if one thing we can do is recognize that to, to have gone through the system or to be in the system is inherently an anger-producing situation, and help people to surface their anger more, we, we would help people to move on with their life. Those of you who know um, the trauma literature or who know how to work with folks who have survived trauma, um, what's the first major step? Is breaking the silence and, <coughs> and really expressing your anger over what's happened to you. And, <coughs> excuse me, I often think of mental health systems as the metaphor I use is it's like a big dam and there's all these raging waters behind it. And the raging water is all the anger that people feel about how they've been treated. But in our system, we often put up a dam in terms of them being able to talk about that. And <coughs> thank heavens, people will talk about their anger in support groups and uh, <coughs> with other peers, and that's great. 
And if you want to see people get over this, quote, lack of motivation that you see in major mental illness, just give people opportunities to talk about their anger and to get past that. And it, it makes a big difference then. People get to a point of acceptance, hope, helpfulness to themselves and to others, coping. And the beauty of the recovery model is that once people start coping well, taking responsibility for their life, start moving on, it naturally gets them to the point of wanting to change the system and to change the larger the community. Part of why recovery is such an exciting concept is it helps people to figure out who they are. In other words, to make personal meaning out of their experience. What has my experience been of being a mental patient? How have I been treated? But it also helps people to understand what they share with other people who have that label. And what you're trying to do is really help people to develop two kinds of consciousness. One, the consciousness that I am a person who can run my life overcoming that internalized idea that people are helpless. You know, I am a person who can run my life as an individual. But you also want people to develop another consciousness, which I would call sort of a class consciousness. People need to understand that people like themselves, in other words, people with a label of mental illness, have been treated in certain ways. And once they understand that as a group, they can support each other and take action out of that. If you only understand your own process, you're not going to be able to do that. So. Um, you know, what's happened to people like me, people with a label of mental illness? What's keeping us down? You know, negative public attitudes, discrimination, all this stuff. And then you can start to formulate how you want things to change. And if you want somebody to, quote, get well or get better, one of the most healing experiences is for them to become involved in advocacy. Because they're actually doing something about the stuff that's been keeping them down. So can you see how there's a natural progression from the personal recovery stuff to more of a social change. And it really incubates, if you will, in peer support groups that are, that are, that are supportive and well-led and so forth. Um, so I, I want to close the recovery session uh, that we're having. God, we're right on time. It's remarkable, considering this morning. <laughs> um, I want to close with a little story about a friend of mine uh, whose name is Kate the Great. Has anybody here ever heard of Kate the Great? Okay, Kate, Kate is a woman. Uh, who taught me many things, um, but one of the things she taught me is that, is that many people in history who had the or the as a middle name are quite remarkable. So can other people think of other people in history who have had the as a middle name? Robert the Bruce? Alexander the Great? William the Conqueror. William the Conqueror. <laughs> Winnie the Pooh, that's my favorite. That's my favorite. Attila the Hun. <laughs> Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Who else? The. Richard the Lionhearted. 